Morning. Be in uh, Psalm 124, 6 through 8. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let's pray. God, thank you for another day. Um, we pray you can open our eyes and ears this morning to the scripture and hear your word. Uh, just thank you for this group of believers, and, uh, this church. In Jesus' name, amen. To be praying for. So let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can gather this morning to fix our eyes on you. Jesus, I pray that we would truly mean those words that you are enough. And God, that on you, the solid rock, we have to build our foundation and that all other ground is sinking sand. Lord, I pray that we would truly believe that and build our lives on that. God, I pray right now for families in our church that are hurting, the makers and the radicals, Lord. I pray that you would bring comfort and healing to their bodies and hearts and minds and souls. God, I pray that they would continue to press into you, to lean into you. God, you promised in Psalm 34 that you are near to the brokenhearted and you save the crushed in spirit. So God, I pray that you would be near to them, help them to see your beauty and your glory, your salvation. And God, continuously fix their eyes on you. God, knowing that uh, Sonia is in a place where our hearts long to be as believers, God, getting to stare and worship and be in your glory forever and ever. God, fix our eyes on you this morning. God, take our eyes off of ourselves, off of all the distractions going on in the world. God, that we would be a people, a family, a corporate assembly with one singular focus, the glory of Christ. And God, I pray that you would glorify yourself even in our weakness. God, if we're being honest, we are weak people and you know that. We have many struggles and flaws. People come in here with many hurts and pains. God, anxieties and doubts. And yet, God, you're so faithful to us. You're faithful to use us like jars of clay, as we'll study here in a minute, to hold this great, beautiful treasure of the knowledge of the glory of God. I pray that we would use it. Even our gathering this morning would be used to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim your glory, to proclaim your excellencies to a world who has no other hope. So open up our eyes this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We've got two more weeks in our series, The Glory of God and Our Weakness, walking through 2 Corinthians 3 and 4, and then we'll jump back into our Genesis series. Uh, but hopefully, hopefully this series has been a good and sweet as we've talked about how glorious uh, the God is that we serve. These verses are just uh, some of the richest, I think, in all of Scripture that remind us of how glorious and weighty uh, the God is that we serve, that you and I serve, and, and hopefully we're seeing that. Uh, I know it's hard for us to admit our weakness. This text is one of those places that we go to often uh, when we need to be reminded of our weakness, and we do, right, when we sang earlier about our weakness we tend to think, I think, that we are stronger than we really are. Uh, we, we tend to have a high view of ourselves and, and much of the American church. You've heard me talk a lot about that, and I'm not the church's judge by any stretch of the imagination. But, but much of the American church is built on a firm foundation of who you are, right? Knowing who you are and less about knowing who God is. I think it's, it's telling. And one of the things that's so telling is uh, the books we read and the sermons we preach and the, the things that are said from the pulpit are often about man, right? How, how often is a New York Times bestseller about 10 steps to a better life or your best life now or, or whatever, books like that, and not so much about God and how great and glorious God is. And that's really backwards from what the Bible's about. If the Bible says a little bit about us, 
but a lot about God. It's giving us a firm foundation about who God is, so then we know and can rightly see who we are. And it always begins with that. It always begins with the foundation, the foundation that we just sang about, that Jesus is it. He is the glorious one. He is the one that all of life and all of creation is moving towards. Right? He has created all things for his glory. And you and I get to be a part of that. We get to play a, a part in that story. We get to enter in to God's glory. And we'll continue to see that here over the next couple of weeks. We're going to talk a little bit about suffering this morning. Over the next uh, couple of weeks, suffering with the resurrection in view or with the resurrection in mind. And I think that's so important to, to remember here. Right? Paul is centered throughout his writings in Scripture on the resurrection, both the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of, of our bodies at the end of the age. So with that, let's open in prayer together. Father, thank you that we can gather this morning to corporately fix our eyes on you. God, I ask one more time that you would open up the eyes of our hearts as we dive into this text in 2 Corinthians 4. Help us to see the wonderful treasure trove that these verses are. God, transform us. And as we already have talked about back in chapter 3, verse 18, it's, it's by staring at the glory of Jesus through Scripture that we're transformed, that we're changed into your image. So God, would you wash over us with the washing of your word, that we would be changed that we would be molded into your image, that we would be a people who are shaped not by the opinion of the world, by the cultural trends, or by our, our own hearts. God, I pray that we would be a people shaped by your word and by your spirit, transformed by your glory, motivated by your resurrection, and in love with your glorification. God, fix our eyes on you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. On July 30th, 1967, at the age of 17, Johnny Erickson Tata decided to go swimming with her sister in the Chesapeake Bay. Many of you have heard uh, her testimony and, and about her story. She was 17 years old, had a promising athletic career and athletic prowess ahead of her when she decided to take a swim in the Chesapeake Bay and she got up onto the diving board, a place she had gone many times, and as she was ready to dive in, the sandbar had shifted without her knowing to where it was about four feet of water. She dove in head first and cracked her neck, and she instantly became a, pair, a quadriplegic. Um, no movement in her arms, no movement in her legs. If you haven't heard of Johnny Erickson Tata, I would definitely encourage you to to Google her story and listen to videos, and she's written many books. Uh, and, and she's wrestled on and off all of her life. She talks about this. this is, I'm just kind of summing up uh, what, what is a long story, but she wrestled on and off with bouts of depression and difficulty and a general feeling of sorry for herself. She talks about the weeks and months and even years on end of her laying there doing nothing but feeling sorry for herself and really how, how God has now begun to shape that. This was... Uh, over 50 years ago now, and how God has shaped that and changed that and molded uh, that in her life to use her for his glory. And she has a great testimony. She, now she's written many books, been, been on many podcasts and written many articles and has spoken all over the world. God has used this pain and suffering to do many things through her. And I love, I love how she described this in one article uh, talking about this overwhelming presence and power of God in the midst of her weakness. This is a lengthy quote, but I think it's worth mentioning. She says this, I wish I could adequately describe what it's like when I'm aware of the overwhelming presence and power of God's grace in my life. It's like living above my wheelchair in a strata of heart-splitting joy that comes with God-breathed courage to tackle whatever lies ahead. Frankly, I believe that the more aware you are of God's grace, the more joy and courage you will have. This raises the question, when are we most aware of God's grace? It isn't when we are riding high with the string of green lights and open doors before us. No, it's when we are needy and feeling spiritually impoverished. 
And, and she argues that's the time when we begin to feel and sense and know God's grace the most. And I think that lines up directly with the message of 2 Corinthians 4, what Paul is proclaiming. God desires, hence the whole series, God desires to show his greatness, his glory through our weakness. In fact, he delights in it. Right? Did you ever wonder why? I mean, I think the, the perfect example is the 12 disciples that Jesus chose. Right? Why didn't he choose Caesar? Why didn't he choose Pilate? Why didn't he choose Herod? He could have chosen whoever. He's the God of the universe. Right? Why didn't he choose some of the great leaders of his time? Maybe, perhaps, and maybe perhaps he chooses us to show his greatness and his glory through our weakness. And after all, it is his glory and his work at stake. This is what the work that he is doing. Just reminding you where we left off last week. Let's read uh, chapter 4, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So your salvation is when God shines the glory of Jesus in your heart so that you can't help but turn to him. Right? Like it's this overwhelming sense of I want to follow Jesus. Right? Christ shines into our hearts and changes us so that we see that he is glorious. Not that, it's, that he gives us good things, but that we see that he is good himself. Right? Like, the, like that's the difference between the true gospel and all the other false gospels out there, including the, the prosperity gospel, which I think is so rampant in the U.S. today, right? Which essentially says Jesus is a means to an end, right? In other words, you follow Jesus and you'll get what you truly want, money or health or wealth or an easy life, comfort, whatever other message comes with that, right? You see, you see that, how that it can easily be twisted, When in reality, the gospel, the true gospel, tells us that Jesus is the end itself. Right? Jesus is the end itself. The gospel is a means to get us to Jesus. Right? The the whole purpose of the gospel is to get us to God. The whole purpose of Jesus coming and dying in our place and rising from the dead is to get us to God. Because our greatest need, our greatest desire, our greatest longing is that we would have right relationship with God. God. And so this is what this text clearly points us to, and it is only through the glory revealing work of God in our hearts that we can see the beauty of Jesus, turn to him, and be changed into his image. And Paul continues this message. So let's look at verse 7 together. 2 Corinthians 4, this is where we'll start this morning. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Right? This is where there was a band uh, that was famous in, I think, the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, Jars of Clay. I believe they're still around. I don't, I don't know. But uh, they, they have some, some good songs out there, and this is where they get their name from, right? Hence why we have a jar of clay up on our weakness side. Paul begins to use this illustration, this analogy, to show how God shines and, and uses us in our weakness for his glory. So first we have to establish what this treasure is. He says, but we have this treasure. Well, I think the verse right before us shows what that treasure is. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If we talk about the gospel as a treasure or the kingdom of God as a treasure, right? Jesus talks about that in, in the book of Matthew. He says the kingdom of God is like finding this great treasure. The shortest the shortest parable he tells. It's like finding this treasure. And, and in his joy, this man finds this treasure. In his joy, he goes and sells all that he has. He buries that treasure, right? He sells all that he has and buys this field so that he may have this treasure. And that's what it's like when we come to know Christ. We want to reject everything else, lose everything else because we can't help but love and know and cherish the treasure that we've been given, the, tre- the treasure of God shining the knowledge of his glory through the face of Jesus Christ in our heart. And that's inexplicable to uh, people who, who haven't tasted that. Or we, can, we can say this is what's happened. This is why personal testimony is important. We can say, like, this is what Christ has done in me. This is the, the joy that he's given me. But we can never truly, uh, someone can never truly sense that or experience that until they are actually in Christ, until they've known Christ, right? This is why it's so difficult at times to explain 
what God has done in our lives. But even in our weakness, even in our difficulty of explaining that, Jesus' glory shines through. So I think a question that we have to ask ourselves first when we talk about this treasure is, do we truly see the great treasure that this is, that we get to have the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus within our hearts? Like, do we see how great a treasure that truly is, that you and I get to have a relationship with the God of the universe? I mean, begin to, begin to shape that in your own mind, right? Like, if we really believe some of the things that we say we believe, like God designed and created with a word everything that exists, the ocean, the trees, the mountains, the stars, that same God who spoke those things into existence desires relationship with us, that's an overwhelming thought. It should be, at least, when we begin to think about that and ponder that. So that's why Paul refers to it as a treasure. And this isn't just something, by the way, that we add on to our lives. Again, why Jesus tells that whole parable in Matthew 13 about selling all you have for the sake of this treasure. He's saying we should be willing to lose everything else because nothing else compares with the gospel, with knowing Christ. I mean, 1 Peter 1, we won't go there right now, but 1 Peter 1 tells us that both the Old Testament prophets and the angels long to look into what you and I are getting to look into. Right, like that, that's crazy, and I don't, I don't fully understand that, but it says angels long to look into that, 1 Peter 1, 12. And the prophets were speaking and pointing towards those things. All the Old Testament was pointing us forward to Christ. That's an overwhelming thought, and you and I are getting to live in the church age right, when we get to experience that. We get to see all of Scripture. We get to have the mystery, Paul talks about this mystery in 2 Corinthians, revealed to us in the face of Christ. And I hope we see the great treasure that that is. The prophets of the Old Testament pointed and waited for it. The angels longed to look into it. This is that treasure. I mean, think about, and, and think about this, right? When he says we have this treasure in jars of clay, think about like the most expensive thing you have or valuable thing you've seen. Uh, I, I personally like to collect baseball cards, uh, and I don't have a super valuable one, so don't try to rob my house. But, but the, the most expensive baseball card was just sold this last year back in August. Uh, it, was, it was a 1911 Honus Wagner card. Only 200 of them were put into existence because uh, he didn't want his image sold with tobacco products, and that's what they used to sell baseball cards with. And so in 1911, only 200 of these um, were printed and, and sent out. And the last one sold at auction in August of this year for $6.6 million. Baseball card, right? Can you imagine? I do, again, I don't have that, so don't, don't rob my house, please. All right. But I, but I enjoy baseball cards. But think about that treasure. Think about how silly if you had that 1911 Honus Wagner card in mint condition and you hid that in a clay planter pot. And think about how, how silly that would be. And now there's a lot of bankers in here, right? And you guys, or you guys are thinking, that would be really dumb, right? You can ask, any, ask Chris. That would be really dumb to do, right? Or anything, jewels, gold, right? Million dollar check, whatever, right? It would be really silly to do that, at least from our perspective. Uh, we have to think, so when, when Paul's using this analogy, this was actually, um, and this is why this is not the perfect example, but this was actually not uncommon in the ancient world, in the first century world. They actually used to put much of their treasure, right, gold and jewels and other valuable coins, into little clay pots uh, to hide them away, and they would kind of hide them away, these, these jars of clay. But now Paul is saying something different. He's saying these jars of clay, essentially, right, which is you and I, by the way, are, are out in the open for all to see, to see this treasure. This is what God, this is what Paul is saying God is doing. So we have to begin to shape our mind. How does God shape or show his glory in our weakness? We have this treasure at right, the knowledge of the glory of God in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Paul is showing us how God wants us to display his majesty. Right? Have you ever felt, maybe just ask yourself this question, rhetorical question, have you ever felt like, man, I, I don't know how to share the gospel because I'm not even worthy of the gospel. I'm not worthy of God's grace. I'm not worthy of God's love. I'm such a bad person. I'm such a hypocrite. All those things are true, by the way. You and I are all that. I remember the first time 
right? I, I grew up kind of in that, that self uh, motivation, self love world, which our world still proclaims to us. And I remember telling that to one of my pastors in college. Just, I, I feel like Satan's telling me this lie, like I'm not worthy. And he said, Actually, Satan's telling you the truth. You're not worthy. But Jesus is. What you do with that is what matters. If we stay there and say, Okay, I'm just going to wallow in this self pity, that's exactly where the enemy wants us. But when we look to Christ and say, Christ, I am unworthy of the grace and love that you have given me. And we run to him. He makes us worthy. That's the beauty of the gospel. And so we have this treasures in jars of clay. God alone is the one with the surpassing power to change those hearts. Look what it, uh, it continues to say. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. What you and I are doing... When we live and walk, this is every aspect of life, right? When we live at our workplace, work at our workplace as ambassadors of Christ, we act as followers of Jesus, we talk as followers of Jesus, or at our home, when we lead our our families in in family worship, when we uh, go out and eat, when we, whatever we do, right? When we do those things, you and I are meant to be like these jars of clay, right? Showing our weakness, displaying our weakness and saying, this is how glorious and grand God is. This is why, by the way, the, the putting on kind of a facade or a mask and coming to church culture will never work. And I'm not talking about a COVID mask, by the way, okay? I'm talking about a, a spiritual mask. I think so often we do that. That's human nature. But I think especially that was cultivated, that culture was cultivated in the church for so long. We kind of have to put on a face, and even though we just cussed at our kids, now we come inside and, and pretend like we have it all together and like everything's okay. And someone asks you, how you doing? I'm, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, right? Maybe that's just the South. I don't know if that's necessarily a New England thing. But, but right, and we kind of pretend like we have it all together and like everything's okay. And, and what we try to do there is not show that we are jars of clay with a treasure in us. We try to show that we're a treasure ourselves. I have it all put together. I'm kind of, so I'm kind of super Christian. I think what Paul is getting across here to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us, and he's going to talk about suffering here in a moment, but I think one of the things we can infer from this text is that it is okay for us to show our weakness and vulnerability while at the same time acknowledging God's power at work within us. It's okay, Christian, to show weakness. We don't have to act like we have it all together. We have all of the answers, because you and I don't. And I think so many people are struggling with that. I think that's why so many people have left the church, because it's such a burden. It was so hard. I had to act like everything was okay, and I wasn't being myself, right? And, and yes, there, there is some tact that goes into gathering and being with one another, absolutely. And yes, we be careful who we're vulnerable and open to. You can't just, I understand, we can't just scream out our sins to the world. But it is okay to show weakness, It is okay to have a conversation with somebody and say, hey, these are the sins I struggle with and I'm battling through and Christ has forgiven me and his grace is enough and I want to continue to walk in holiness. I want to continue to serve him. But I'm still battling. I'm still in the process. It's okay to admit that. What we're doing in that moment is showing that we are jars of clay with a treasure in us. The treasure is not our own holiness. Our own holiness will follow. That's part of sanctification, right? Jesus will mold us and shape us into his image. But the treasure is the grace and glory of Jesus within us. The gospel, that's the whole gospel. When we try to act like everything is okay, this is what we actually do. We actually belittle the gospel and Jesus' work. We actually begin to say, I don't need Jesus as much as I'm putting off. When we are willing to show our weakness, we are actually lifting Christ up and saying his glory, his work on the cross and in his resurrection is enough for me. And so I want to make much of his grace. And so, yes, I'm still a wreck. Yes, I'm still weak in many areas. And I want to continue to be molded into his image. But his grace is what's getting me through. His grace is what has saved me and his grace is what is sanctifying me. It's okay to show that. The world does not need religious superstars or cool, relevant Christians. 
It's not what the world needs at all. There's too many people like that. There's too many big Twitter accounts and big platform guys who are trying to act cool and relevant to the world. What the world needs is repentant followers of Jesus who proclaim his power. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but what I do with that is what matters. I repent and I turn to Christ. And I look to him, and day by day by day, I'm changed into his image, and I'm changed into his image, and I'm changed into his image until I die and go to be with him and ultimately am changed into his image. It's a long process. You, we're never going to arrive. Eugene Peterson, you've heard me quote, he wrote a book, I think that just sums it up so well, called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's just what a summary of our lives. We're continuously, day by day, looking to Jesus, looking to Jesus until we die and we get to physically look at Jesus. What a life. Let's keep looking to him. The world does not need to see how relevant you are. The world needs to see how weak you are and how powerful God is within you. That's what the world needs to see. It needs to see this treasure in jars of clay. So be willing to be open. Let's be an open people. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about glorifying sin at all. People kind of clam up with that, like, well, are we going to glorify sin? That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about willingly admitting and talking to someone. Maybe when you, even when you share the gospel, right? ask yourself that. Is it more like a sales pitch that you're trying to get someone to buy into? Or are you openly saying, look, this is what I have struggled and battled. This is my heart, and look what Christ has done, and look what he is doing within me. He can do the same for you. Look what his word says. Like, do we really see that this is real? This isn't just some tract we're passing out. This is truth emanating from the face of Jesus. That's what this word is. Let's continue on. Verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Let's walk through this for a moment. First, the true message of the Bible, and again, we've already mentioned this, but the true message of the Bible never promises that you and I will be spared from hardship, suffering, persecution, disease, or death. We, ha- we have to shape that into our minds. I mean, Jesus' miracles, we, we constantly point back to Jesus' miracles. Well, Jesus did these miracles. Yes, they were to attest to who he was. So that's the whole purpose. The, it, the purpose was never about the, the miracle or the healing. Do we believe miracles and healing still happen? Absolutely, right? God still does those things. But they are always to point to his glory so that he would be known and treasured and glorified. That's all, that's, Jesus said that, right, in the book of John. Like, my works are attesting to who I am as the son of God. That's why Christ did these things. And so we have to get over this mindset, this kind of comfortable Christianity. That if we come to Christ, like, everything's going to be okay and we're going to have an easy life and this easy believe, believism that marks so much of American Christianity today, is a facade. It's a facade. It was never meant to be that way, right? That's why we have such a hard time, I think, connecting when Jesus says, like, hey, they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Like, what are you you talking about? I'll show Jesus. Right? That's not the message of the Bible at all. If we truly live as Christ has called us to live, We will be persecuted. We will be hated. We will have these things said of us. The true message of the Bible never promises ease or comfort from uh, or sparing from hardship, suffering, persecution, disease, or death. After all, Jesus himself, the perfect example is to go to the Son of God himself. Jesus himself suffered and died in our place. He was a man of many sorrows, as Isaiah 53 tells us. He is our example. Let's let's walk through this slowly together. Verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Speaking strictly in earthly terms, a believer is susceptible to all the sufferings of an unbeliever. I think this flies in the face of uh, the prosperity gospel, right? Of the easy believism of so much that marks so much of American Christianity. That if we come to know Christ, we 
uh, somehow get a pass through the sufferings and, and away from the sufferings that much of the world goes through. And so when cancer hits or when disease hits or death hits or suffering or sorrow hits, we, we think, where is God in this moment? God has never, ever promised that you and I will not walk through those things. He didn't promise that we wouldn't walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He promised he would be with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's so important to remember. But this verse right there, I think we are afflicted in every way. In other words, there's not a single way in, in which unbelievers go through suffering and hardship that Christians are somehow not susceptible to. Outside, obviously we're not talking, we're talking about in strictly earthly terms, we're not talking about right, the final judgment. We're not talking about heaven and hell here. We're talking about on earth, you and I are susceptible to everything that unbelievers go through. This isn't a message that is just focused on our earthly lives. It is, and Christ changes us, and he works in us. But it always, right, the whole message of the gospel has the resurrection in mind, the resurrection of Christ and our own resurrection. It's important that we keep that in mind. We are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We may go through many physical trials, but because of God's power in us, we are not crushed. And even death, by the way, and that's not talking about death, even if we could say it like this, we are afflicted in every way, including death. We may die, but we're not crushed. Again, the resurrection is in mind. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate us from eternity. COVID couldn't separate Sonia from eternity. She's gone from this life, and she's getting to stare at the face of Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. That word perplex means confusion or discouragement. I think a lot of us kind of have this, again, this goes back to the putting on a mask and kind of pretending everything's okay. A lot of us kind of have this view, if we have any kind of discouragement or even doubt that we must not be a believer, or maybe Jesus isn't near, Paul saying, like, they were often perplexed. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul, saying, like, yeah, sometimes I was confused. Like, God, why is this happening? What is going on? Why am I going through this, right? He's saying, we're perplexed in those ways, but not driven to despair. We may be confused as to why many things happen. In fact, we may have questions and may not understand why certain things happen, but we do not resort to despairing. Being a Christian does not mean, listen carefully, being a Christian does not mean we have an answer for every pain and hardship in our life. But being a Christian does mean we have a hope for every pain and hardship in our life. You and I will not have an answer. There will be some things that we will say, and that these are the three words I've been trying to get us to say, I don't know. There's going to be some things that we go through, that we walk through, that we'll say, I don't know, but I have a hope that I can follow through. I have a shepherd who will lead me and guide me and walk with me, through with me every step of the way. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death. He will carry us, and no one will be able to snatch us out of his hand. Remind yourself of the, those truths, Christian. This is why it's so important that we constantly are in our word, in the Bible, so that those truths, when we walk through suffering, we're not driven to despair, but rather we're driven to clinging to those promises. I'm suffering, and I'm going through pain and hardship, but Christ is with me, but Christ will never leave me, but Christ is my anchor, but Christ will hold on to me. Because he won't ever leave us. We're perplexed, perplexed, but not driven to despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. When you and I experience persecution, I think we are often tempted to believe that God has abandoned us. I remember uh, one of my missionary friends, I have a missionary friend who serves in Southeast Asia and uh, in, a, in a foreign country that's hostile to Christianity. It's illegal to proselytize, and, and he's there as a missionary. And I remember him coming back, this was as, as I was serving as a pastor in New Mexico. And, and he came back to our church and and we were going through some issues and some struggles, and I remember just thinking, like, man, how's this guy go to a, you know, a foreign nation uh, with, with Islam everywhere and, and you know, preach the gospel? And he said, the battle that you guys go through within the churches today, in the American churches, and even the persecution, is much more difficult than I, anything I'm going through. 
I remember that statement shocked me. And I was like, what, what are you talking about, Chris? And we talked through that a little bit. And he said, you know, like, we know who is against us. It's really easy to say, like, this person is not a believer. And this person is a clear believer. There's a clear delineation there. But in the American church so often, right, those things have been so uh, meshed together that it's hard to tell, right? Most of the persecution there in Southeast Asia comes from outside the church. Much of the persecution here will come from within the church. And that's why there's so much division today. We've seen that division just get worse and worse, and I think the last 18 months have really not caused division, but shown division that's been there for a while. So Christian, we have to say, like, do we really believe more than anything else, more than our nation says, more than our favorite political party says, more than our favorite news anchors say, more than our, uh, our favorite whatever says, do we really believe that the words that are in here are true? You and I are going to be persecuted for that. It may not just be physical. It may be verbal, right? We're already beginning to experience those things. And he said, I remember uh, Chris saying, like, those things are often more difficult than the, the physical persecution. You and I will be persecuted. We can expect that. But we don't have to fret in that, right? We are persecuted, but not forsaken. God has not abandoned us. If anything, persecution actually confirms our place in Christ. Right? We should rejoice. I mean, have you ever wondered, read, read the passage in, in Acts when Peter and John, you remember this? They were arrested by the Jewish leaders. They were thrown into prison, and then they were beaten, they were whipped, right? And when they got out, what did they say? Man, I'm going to get a lawyer and sue those guys. No. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the name. Is that our response? When the government hates us, when the government puts mandates on us, when the government persecutes the church in some ways that, that we're seeing even now, is our response joy? I, I admit, and this is where coming, being open, mine has not been. Do we rejoice that we are counted worthy to suffer for the sake of the name because our persecution shows our place in Jesus? It reveals that you and I are in Christ. And so, Christian, let us rejoice in this time. Let's be a church. Let's be weird, right? We've talked about that before. We're going to look weird already. Let's be really weird. Let's rejoice. Let's take joy when we're persecuted, when, when we suffer for the sake of the name. What an awesome picture that would be to this world. This world doesn't need more division or fighting. This world needs more hope and joy in Jesus. Let's proclaim him through our words, through the way that we act. You and I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We can expect that, but our shepherd is with us. Our shepherd will not ever leave us. Let's continue on. Struck down, but not destroyed, right? This is probably a wrestling term. Paul liked to use a lot of athletic terms, and he's using this term that was called stri striking down. In other words, they would take the opponent to the ground, right? This means to be beaten to the ground, and he's probably talking here both physically and and psychologically by those who hate Christians. And you and I are going to be beaten to the ground, maybe physically, definitely psychologically, definitely mentally, definitely spiritually. We know Satan and his goons hate us. You and I are going to be beaten. Yes, people will hate us. That's a, that's a really hard thing for people like myself who, who are natural people pleasers, right? I want people to like me, and I think many of us are like that. We're just going to have to get used to being hated. We have to get used to being weird and get used to being hated. A lot of people hated Jesus. We tend to think like everyone was attracted to Jesus. Yeah, not so much. Remember that time he said, hey, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and everyone was like, Pfft. right? Like, yeah, no thanks. A lot of people hated Jesus. That's why they had him arrested and killed. You and I got to get used to being hated. And that's okay. We're going to love those who hate us. We're going to pray for those who hate us. We're going to keep pointing them to Christ because we are struck down but not destroyed. They cannot destroy us even if they kill us. No one can separate us from the love of Christ. Remember that, Christian, as we walk through these times. No one can separate us. 
we got to hustle through. I know I'm taking my time here. Verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. We are constantly suffering so that others may see Jesus in us. Verse 11. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. In other words, you and I are going to be persecuted and hated oftentimes. And, and dying, right? He's saying we're carrying in ourselves the, the death of Jesus, what Jesus experienced, what Jesus went through, so that others would have life, so that others would see the resurrection power within us. And Jesus said this. Flip over with me quickly to John chapter 12. Hold your finger in 2 Corinthians 4. We'll go back there, but flip over with me to John chapter 12, starting in verse 23. Look what Jesus says here, verse, John 12, starting verse 23. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Right? That's himself, the Son of Man. Verse 24, Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is using a right, simple analogy. In other words, if you have a seed and I were to put it right here, the seed's going to live. It's not going to die, but it's also not going to grow. It's not going to do anything, Right? But if I take that same seed, whatever that seed is, and, and I plant it into the ground, it's going to die, and many other seeds are going to be grown through that. It's going to bear much fruit, right? You see the simple analogy that, that Jesus is using there. And he's saying in verse 25, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In other words, our love for the next life, our love to be with Jesus forever in the new heaven and the new earth should, should cause our life here to look like self-hate. Right? He's not saying literally hate yourself, right? But he's saying our love in comparison to the love that we have for the next life. In other words, we are so willing to lay down our lives. We are so willing to give away money, even though we'll be taken advantage of. We're so willing to, be, to give away time, even though we'll be taken advantage of, that it looks like self-hate because we are so focused on the resurrection. We are so focused on the age and the life to come. That's a radical lifestyle right there that Jesus calls us to. And he's the one who modeled it, by the way. That seed that he's talking about doesn't begin with us. Again, this is, where, this is where we go back to foreshadowing from the Old Testament, and this could go down a different bunny trail. But remember the seed? Talked about in Genesis chapter 3, a seed from Eve would come and crush the serpent's head. Jesus is picking up on that same, that same theme, and we'll see that over and over and over again. This seed that leads to this branch, which leads to this king, right? That's a theme we see throughout the Old Testament. That's Jesus. He's that seed who dies so that much fruit would be born out of that. And think about it. That one seed has died, and millions and millions of Christians throughout history have come to know Christ. Let me think about that. One man. You and I believe that one man came down out of heaven, fully man and fully God. He died on the cross. And then he, three days later, he came back to life. And now he's seated on a heavenly throne. And millions of other people throughout history have believed that as well. have been saved by it. And now you and I get to model what Jesus did. We get to model laying down our life. Laying down our lives. Laying down our desires for the sake of the other person. This is what marriage is supposed to model. This is what parenting is supposed to model. This is what pastoring is supposed to model. This is what every aspect of life is supposed to model. We lay down our own desires. We lay down our own thoughts. We lay down our own wills. For the sake of Christ. We die to ourself as Christ literally died so that others would live, so that others would see the life of Christ in us. That's what Paul is saying there. We who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. And literally, they were being given over to death. None of us have experienced that yet. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so death is at work in us but life in you. This is the complete opposite, by the way, of the, the message of the world, 
Right? The, the world shouts messages at us all the time. I mean, you guys have seen these memes or articles all the time. Cut toxic people out of your life or take care of you first or self-care is the most important thing or whatever. It's all focused on self. That's not the Bible. That's not the gospel. That's not what Christ calls us to. He says, die to yourself. Die to your desires so that others would see Christ in us. Because guess what? A thousand years from now, the, the short 70 or 80 or 90 years or 20 years that we lived on this life, it's not going to matter. What will matter is Christ and how we used it for eternal things. How well we took care of ourselves, how much money we made, and the, the, how great of a career we built. Those things are not going to matter. Those things will fade away. How we use those things and use those platforms for the sake of the gospel will matter. What we did with the time that was given to us and the resources that was given to us will matter. A thousand, a million, a billion, a trillion years from now. And on and on and on. Let's live for that. Let's live for the things that will matter, not self-care. What you do with your suffering matters. So, so please don't hear me in that saying, what you do in life doesn't matter. That is not true. What you do with the platforms given to you, what you do with the resources and the time and the family given to you absolutely matters. But it only matters as much as it lines up with Christ's will and purposes. With what Christ calls us to. To die to ourself and to proclaim his excellency. So what you do with your suffering matters. And that's why he says in verse 12. So death is at work in us, but life in you Weeping and heartache and grieving are all part of the healing process, but in the midst of all that, we show people Jesus as he comforts our hearts. And he is faithful to do so. Let's quickly go through 13 through 15. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Right? He quotes from Psalm 116 here and says, what we proclaim, what we see is what we will proclaim. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. So, so David here writing the psalm, he believed in God and so he proclaimed God. You and I, like David, have the same spirit. We believe and so we proclaim. We also believe and we also speak. Verse 14, knowing that he, God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. There's that resurrection. Right? Everything is focused, centralized on the resurrection. Jesus was raised by God, God will raise us up also as followers of Christ. Like that is what we're living for. That's what we are focused on. And so we can proclaim as weak jars of clay with this treasure inside of us, we proclaim. We can be confident in our proclamation because we have a resurrection hope. According to verse 14, the presence of Jesus is the motivation for the proclamation of Jesus. Right, like the, the whole purpose Paul is working towards is so that he would be in Jesus' presence. Let's read verse 14 again. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us up, us also with Jesus, and bring us with you into his presence. Sonia's getting to experience that right now. Many of our loved ones, millions of believers who have gone before us, are getting to experience that right now. Being in the presence of Jesus. Proclaiming Jesus. So that motivation, that future motivation is what should totally motivate us to proclaim now. To live as jars of clay with this treasure inside of us. So ask yourself that. Is that what motivates you? Is the spread of the gospel and the glory of Christ what motivates you? And we'll end here in verse 15. For it is all for your sake, he begins to make it personal, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Christian, don't be fooled into thinking that Christianity is somehow dying. The church isn't going to fail. It never will. Christianity will continue to spread. Grace will continue to abound to more and more people. The gospel is still spreading like wildfire throughout the world. Jesus will continue to change hearts. He still is. Personally, we're a testament to that. Jesus 
is using us in our weakness to show his glory. And it will increase to thanksgiving, right? We give thanks to God, and it will increase to the glory of God. So ask yourself these questions, Christian. Is the glory of Jesus in our church worth suffering for? Is the glory of Jesus as we gather as a people, as we do life together as a people, worth suffering for? Is the glory of Jesus in your family worth suffering for? It's going to be a lot of hard decisions that we have to make, and I think in our culture it's just going to have to get harder. Is, that, is the glory of Jesus worth suffering for? Is seeing Jesus face to face one day worth suffering for? Is the glory of Jesus among the nations worth suffering for? And why is it worth people going, and I don't remember how many hostages were in Haiti, but 16, I think, hostages in Haiti. And I saw an article saying, was it worth it? Why did they go? And blah, blah, blah. Absolutely is worth it. Paul thought it was worth it. That's why he went and got his head chopped off for the sake of the gospel. Peter thought it was worth it. That's why he had to watch with his eyes glued open, his wife crucified to a cross, and then he afterwards was hung upside down. He thought that was worth it. Many and many men and women before us who have been burned at the stake, sawed in half, eaten by lions, shot in the head, and many other things, they all will say it's worth it. I'm sure if we could ask anyone right now who's in heaven with Jesus, they would do it over and over and over again, a thousand times over for the sake of Christ. So that's what motivates us. We will be in the presence of Jesus. So like jars of clay, like Johnny Erickson Tata, like Paul and many others, let's trust Christ to shine his glory and majesty through our weakness so that he would be known and glorified in our lives. So Christian, be open with others. And let's, be, let's be open with others. Let's be vulnerable. Showing people that it's all about Jesus. The, the work, my life as a Christian is the work that Christ is doing in me. His grace is not just for my salvation. It's not just for my past sins. It's for my future sins as well. And it's for my future sanctification. He died and shed his blood so that I would be changed into his image. So let's be willing to be open so that we would be like jars of clay, showing the greatness of the treasure within us so that others, even through our weakness, would see how Christ has used us for his purposes. And keep using your life in whatever platform you've been given. We've all been given a platform here. At work, at home, in this community. Use that to make much of Jesus, knowing that one day you will see him face to face. We will be with Christ, and so that it would increase to thanksgiving towards him and to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Thank you for this text. that rightly and lovingly beats us into the ground to remind us of our weakness and then lovingly and gracefully builds us back up so that we could see the beauty of your glory in our weakness. We could see the beauty of just being mere clay pots with your treasure, the treasure of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Let us see the beauty of that. And let us be a people who are open, who are openly showing we are weak, weak people, and yet you are strong within us, and yet you are working within us, yet you are molding us into your image. And God, I pray that with reckless abandon, with a radical life that marks us off as weird and strange to the rest of the world, we would use all of our time, our talents, our resources, everything we have to show off your greatness to a world so desperately in need of it. All other ground is sinking sand. This world has no hope without Christ. We have the one treasure that gives an eternal hope. So let us proclaim it with our lives, with our actions, with our words. Continue to use us, Lord, even in our weakness for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I hope we truly believe that. Right? Our, our power, all the glory is not in ourselves, yet not I, but through Christ in us. Let's use this week, use the talents and resources and platforms we've been given for his glory to make much of him. He's, he's worth it. Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth suffering for in every aspect of life. Andrew's going to pray us out.
Come join us again tonight at 6. There's some questions in there. Feel free to grab those. And right after service, we're going to go pack some shoe boxes, all for the glory of Jesus. So suffering through a few hunger pains is a good way to model this, by the way. Suffering through a few hunger pains to pack some shoe boxes so that kids and other nations could hear the gospel. Perfect way to model that. So, all right. With that, Andrew's going to pray for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you um, just for your word that renews our hearts and our minds and um, just that is completely contrary and opposite to everything that we're told out in the world and um, in our jobs and social media and TV, Lord. Thank you for the truth that can um, hold us and help us. And I just pray that every, all of us here, that that seed would fall on good ground and that um, we would remember that. Um, it is in our weakness that um, your strength is found. And so help us to rejoice in those weaknesses and just bless your people as they go forth and share that hope and light with their communities. And um, we love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>